Hello and welcome to the first video in a brand new mini series. This is all about going from a completely uninstalled model through to setting up iNav completely on this multi rotor, and that will also then give me the ability to also do things like mission flying and show you all those tips and tricks. Now, I have done a lot of videos on iNav over the years. I think the first one was back in the end of 2016, early 2017, uh, back in the days of 1.5 and 1.6. And uh, back then, iNav was a bit of an exotic project that not many people were using. And those early videos are quite funny to go and watch back now because iNav has come an incredibly long way. The interesting thing is that with iNav 3.0 that I'm about to put onto this quadcopter, uh, the setup and the process is 90% the same. So not a lot has changed. But modern long range models like this are finally being starting to ship with a GPS and a compass and barometer as well. So they are perfect to put iNav on for some extra features that you don't get in systems like Betaflight. Now this series is aimed at all of you that have maybe th been thinking about this. Uh, it's not aimed at a complete new beginner people to iNav. Check out my iNav for Beginners series 2020. That goes through everything in quite a lot of detail. Uh, I'm going to probably end up doing maybe three, maybe four videos in this little series. And then I'll probably do another little mini series putting iNav onto a wing with all the stuff that I've learned over the past six or seven weeks. And that's because unfortunately at the moment the iNav documentation is still playing catch up with some of the new stuff stuff that's available and I kind of want to make sure that if you are wanting to have a go at iNav uh, you have the benefit of kind of following somebody that's been doing it for a little while. So a couple of things before we get onto the bench and start actually putting software onto computers and onto flight controllers. First thing to know is that you cannot just put iNav onto any uh, multi-rotor like this and just expect it to all work with the GPS flight modes. As I've mentioned, iNav needs a compass and it ideally also needs a barometer as well for it to be able to use all those fab GPS flight modes that it has. So if your quadcopter only has a GPS, which a lot of them do, uh, and doesn't have a compass, doesn't have a barrow, the iNav GPS flight mode sadly won't work. You can add an external compass and lots of people do that, uh, but those are requirements if you want to run iNav with the flight modes. Well, with the GPS flight modes anyway. iNav is a lot more exacting about things like accelerometer and compass calibration. And those are two things you'll see in a moment when we start um, configuring this little fella up. Uh, whereas in a lot of other software, you just put the multi-rotor level on the bench and you kind of, you know, say that's level. Uh, with iNav, there's a little bit more to it. It wants to do a full accelerometer calibration. It isn't unique to iNav. In fact, things like Arducopter and other systems also have that six position uh, qualification of how the accelerometer is mounted and what the values are all going to be. And then the second thing is compass calibration. You need to go through a little dance, again we'll do that on the bench in a minute, uh, to make sure that the compass reads accurately. And if the compass isn't reading accurately then you get something called toilet bowling uh, when you are in um, nav position hold. Well, rather than sit in 3D space, it kind of does this and gets gradually more and more aggressive. So there are some extra steps. So if you're a beta flight pilot and you know the beta flight interface very well, that's going to put you in great stead. But you can't uh, just apply the beta flight knowledge to iNav. There are some extra little wrinkles. Different PIDs and PIFs. Uh, so you can't also just import the tune from an existing model into iNav iNav also has changed things dramatically from iNav 2.61 and 2.6 to iNav 3.0 and 3.01 that's kind of kicking around at the moment. So you pretty much have to start from scratch. The PID controller I don't think is as sophisticated as the one in Betaflight. So there is a little bit of uh, work needed to get a model tuned up. There are a couple of extra things as well that you need to set up, things like what the hover throttle is for the model, so you need to have enough idea what that is. Uh, there's something called altitude hold, so it will actually maintain its position uh, above the ground, and that's also used when you do things like uh, return to home, mission flying, um, things like the GPS nav position hold where it parks itself in 3D space. So by setting the that throttle value, it means that when you flick into it, uh, the copter goes to that value first. So there's always some extra little wrinkles. 
Last thing I'll comment on before we get into the bench is how you set up your radio. The radio setup always looks like this. You have your standard four controls in whatever order your radio uses. Throttle, elevator, aileron, rudder, uh, or aileron, elevator, throttle, rudder, however it is, doesn't matter, we can sort that out in INAV, and you need two additional switches as a minimum, one for arming and one for modes. I'd recommend a three position switch for your modes, that will allow you to set it up so that it's going to fly. No mixes at all, and it doesn't matter if you're going to be using INAV in a wing, a fixed wing, a multi-rotor like we're about to do, that is always the same model. So the really nice thing is, you can have one INAV model and then just copy it on your radio and rename it to whatever model you're doing. So you might set it up initially for one of these things and then the next time you put it in a wing, you can use the same model and it's very quick. Right, enough of me banging on. Let's go on the bench and start to put INAV onto this Recon 7 Quad. So I would recommend if you have a quadcopter that's already got something like Betaflight on it, then I would connect it to your computer with Betaflight Configurator and save that configuration down. You either, either dump or diff all command in the CLI so that you have a reference. Now this quad already has iNav on it, so we're going to plug it in and do a full configuration. Uh, the first thing we need to do though is download the configurator. Now the configurator is really easy to get hold of. First thing we need to do is go to the iNav main pages. Uh, this is what they look like here. Uh, this is the, all the documentation for iNav. The link to the iNav configurator is on there. And we just need to download the one that we're interested in, available for Mac OS, Linux, and Windows. We will download the Windows one, just for uh, ease. So we'll download it and open that file. Uh, the great thing is with the configurator is you don't need to install it as such. It just kind of runs from here. So if we just control C, we'll copy that. Control V, and these are all the files that we're going to need. And then once that is all copied across, we have configurator. We can go in there, run the application, and that is INAV. So we're going to, first of all, need to flash this thing. Oh, let's, let's tell uh, Windows that actually it's a fine application to run. Sometimes happens that when it's a new version of configurator that hasn't been seen a lot. Now the first thing we're going to need to do is to flash iNav onto the flight controller. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm just going to plug it in while we're waiting for iNav to start. Apologies for the beeps, this has a lost model alarm on it, which is a good idea. So we're going to click on connect. Uh, the only thing we're actually really interested in is going into the CLI and typing in version, because I just want to make sure I know exactly what target we need. HGLRC F722. Now let's disconnect. Go into firmware flasher. Uh, H for HGLRC, there we are, that's the one we want. Latest version of iNav. This is exactly the same as you would do if you were flashing Betaflight, if you know Betaflight. Uh, the only thing I recommend is select full chip arrays. Full chip arrays is really important to make sure that nothing uh, none of the settings or anything in EEPROM is going to cause you a problem. So we're going to load firmware online. And we're going to flash the firmware. Now it's going to reboot into DFU mode and it's going to first of all erase everything and then it's going to flash it. This is exactly the same if you're a beta flight pilot. This is all going to feel very, very familiar indeed. Now when it boots up, it's going to first of all ask us what kind of model it's in and then we need to go through two really important calibrations, that accelerometer calibration and the Compass 1 too. But let's not get too far ahead of ourselves, let's just watch the final pieces of it flashing. I'm not going to speed this up, this is how long it takes. There we are, all verified. We'll wait for the flight controller to reboot and to be happy. And then when it is, we'll click on connect. And the first thing it's going to do, it's going to ask us what kind of model. We can either have a mini quad, which is what we've got here, uh, airplane with a tail or an airplane without a tail. That's the wings that I tend to put iNav on a lot. You can also even have rovers and boats. We're going to go with mini quad with three to seven inch prop. That is then going to reboot the flight controller and iNav with all of those presets ready to go. 
Now, once it's rebooted, we can reconnect and we can start working down this left hand side. First thing we need to do, and the most important and the biggest difference between this and things like Betaflight is the fact there is a six point calibration need for the accelerometer. So we're gonna to have to put it in one of six positions. So let me put it flat first. We'll click on calibrate accelerometer and then we will click calibrate and that will give us level. And then what we need to do is go through each of these individual positions shown on screen one by one. And if it misbehaves, sometimes it does this on this particular model, just go back. And you're gonna, we're gonna work our way through putting it in each attitude. The trick is it doesn't have to be exactly 90 degrees, but you want it to be still while you're doing this. Something like a box or edge of a desk to hold it against is incredibly useful. Apologies for all of the really loud beeping. Okay. Last one here. We need it nose up. This is why I like to do this outside of the model. So we'll say we're happy with that. Save and reboot. Now, if the accelerometer calibration has worked okay, when it comes back up, in the setup screen, we should see it sat pretty much straight and level, which it kind of is. I'm really happy with that, that looks good. And if we move the nose up, it's there, tilt right, tilt left. Yeah, that looks good to me. So the accelerometer is good. The next really important part is to calibrate the compass. Now, there is usually a compass in the external GPS at the back, and that's connected via the I squared C pins. Occasionally you can have a situation where there's an onboard compass as well. Now it's naturally picking up a compass, uh, but let me show you what a badly set up compass looks like, the big trick. Because if the compass isn't set up perfectly, the INAV flight uh, return to home GPS stuff is not gonna work. So we're gonna hit calibrate compass, and then it's gonna give us 30 seconds, and we've got to kind of put it in all the different attitudes. Uh, ideally, just I would just rotate it with one side down to the ground, and then you've got a chance of getting everything working. Just do this as much as you can within the 30 seconds. Ideally, you wanna do this away from the magnetic fields, from electronics, and then pop it on the desk. And we'll say save and reboot. Now this won't be happy. And I'll show you how to check to see immediately, it's obvious when it isn't happy. So at the moment, we are seeing the flight controller kind of flicking from one to the other. And if you actually look here, it's the heading or degrees. Now it's not the accelerometer or the gyro that's actually telling it it's moving. It's the red direction for the compass. The big tip, if you lift the nose up and the heading changes and you lift the nose down and the heading then sweeps, can you see that? It goes one side, the nose up, and it goes to the other side, nose down. That is indicating that the compass itself is set incorrectly in the configurator. Now, uh, the way that the compass is physically installed onto the model or underneath the compass is set here and there's all these different ones to do. If you ever have this situation where the compass is doing that, where lifting the nose and dropping the nose makes the quadcopter spin around, uh, I would work through each of these in turn and then go back, do your uh, compass calibration and then get it so that it doesn't swing around. Now I'm going to cheat a little bit here um, and what I'm gonna do, I'm actually going to look at my diff all file that I know works with this. If I zoom down here, we can actually see that is all the mag stuff. So what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna copy that and gonna pop it into the CLI and put it in. Now obviously you're not gonna have that on a new setup, but that's, um, would just get the magnetometer set up properly. Otherwise you'd have to kind of work through all the different permutations. Okay, 
So now it looks pretty good. It's not flicking around. And when I lift the nose up, it's not giving that really weird situation where when the nose is down versus when the nose is up, we're not like getting, you know, 40, 50 degrees of change. Those are two really important parts. So the calibration stuff is really important. Make sure the accelerometer is calibrated and reads as level on the desk. Make sure that the compass is calibrated. These are numbers that I had here. And if you can't get it to calibrate, the trick is go into here. And the first thing that I would do is run through each of these mag alignment options to get the one that you need. Now we've done that, we have done the hardest part. The rest of it is very similar to uh, beta flight, if you know things like that. So we're going to load the mixer. Again, we can load multi-rotor, airplane, tricopter, or whatever. Uh, we've told it it's a multi-rotor. We're going to go for a quad X. Again, there's all these different ones we could choose from, but we're just going to say load and apply. And that is going to then save the mixer that's going to mix all the controls into the relevant ESCs for the motors. And now when we go into setup, you'll see we have the little graphic of the quadcopter now rather than the box because the mixer has been configured. Next one is outputs. This is the last one we set up. At the moment, the enable servo and motor outputs isn't enabled. That means that you cannot accidentally set it up so that um, it kind of bursts to life on the desk. That is literally the last thing that we do. We can set the ESC protocol here, show DSHOCK 600, and um, at the moment, we're just gonna leave everything like that. We'll just save it. In the old days, in presets, we used to have all these things. Uh, we can select generic seven inch quadcopter. Uh, there used to be a lot more than these for particular models, uh, but we'll just apply that and we'll save and reboot again. And again, all we're doing is we're just working our way down from the top uh, to set everything up. Last couple of things now we need to do. Um, ports is obviously really important. We need to set these up. Now I happen to know that on this model, UART2 is going to be the GPS, which is there, thank you. Uh, Tramp is gonna be UART3. Save and reboot. That's gonna be allows to control the VTX and that's where the GPS is connected to. And we have to enable the GPS in the ports because you see at the moment it won't appear at the top because the next tab is configuration. Now this is the one we briefly looked at to set up everything. But we are going to go and we're going to say that we want to use GPS for navigation and telemetry. A couple of other things we'd probably tweak in here. Uh, I would make sure that an air mode is permanently enabled. Um, and that will do for now. Actually, there's the VTX stuff in here. It isn't a separate tab. So let's save and reboot again. And now we can go and check failsafe. Uh, now you'll see the GPS has appeared. So we will click on return to home, which is going to be what we want it to do. Save and reboot again. That means that in the event of a failsafe, it will fly back to us, which is kind of the whole point of having iNav on something like this. Pit tuning, we will play with later in the series. I'm not gonna to get too much into the detail with this. Uh, rates and expo, we'll leave everything pretty standard. Advanced tuning, again, this is a tab that we can come back to later in everything. Uh, do keep your eye on these uh, pieces up here because it will tell you the stuff that you haven't yet done. Receiver, we're going to use the standard stuff for that. Uh, we're going to select it to match the order that is on your radio. And then in the modes tab, I would do standard stuff. I would add a range for arming. Uh, mine's channel six by default. I would uh, add horizon as the low channel position, uh, that's gonna allow you to arm it because you can't arm in the GPS modes. I would then add something like nav position hold and then nav return to home. And that will allow us to test the th all of the pieces for the flight. Now, because we've got a beeper on here, I'd also potentially add the beeper things as well. Um, that's probably gonna be, I think channel seven is probably where that is. That will allow us to make the beeper sound if it comes down in the grass. 
So now the modes have been set, we've got arming and we've got a horizon mode, GP, nav position hold and nav return to home. We can test everything. The GPS has gone blue, that means it's receiving packets, it's happy. And then the last things we can do is then check the way that the on-screen display is all laid out. Now the OSD, and uh, if this came with something like Betaflight on it, is very different. There's lots of specialized characters. So I would go into Font Manager and I would upload the iNav font onto the flight controller. Again, if you went back from iNav to Betaflight, you'd have to go the other way and upload that font again. Loads of extra things on here that I'd recommend. I'd recommend showing how many satellites you've got, showing HDOP as well, and also adding distance direction to home is things that I tend to have. I'm not gonna show all those things uh, because that's pretty standard stuff. I've shown it in a million other videos. So last thing we are going to do is we're going to set the hover throttle and then that will finish kind of the basic setup. So if we say get hover, the hover throttle by default in iNav is set at 1500. That's way too much for a powerful quad like this. It's actually hovering more about 1260. So we'll say set and then we'll just cut that whole thing and cheat. We'll paste it in there. I think if we go about 260, 1260, we say save, then we're in a really good place. There's only one last thing that I'd watch at the moment. Uh, the radio is off, so the receiver should be in fail safe, and that should also be being seen by the flight controller, and we can see the fail safe mode is absolutely being seen. Last thing we can do then before we do everything is go into the outputs and enable motor and servo output and save that. And that is the basic configuration done. So join me in the next video where we will do the final little tweaks. That is iNav set up. The biggest thing about this is making sure the accelerometer is calibrated and the compass is calibrated. And now we're in a position where we can tweak a few things, go to the field, test that it flies in horizon mode, then try a loiter, and then also try a GPS return to home to confirm all the sensors and all that calibration and setup that I've just done is good. Thank you for spending your time today watching that video. You can find me in all the usual places on social media. And if you're trying to learn about a subject, then check out the playlist. All of my videos are organized into easy to follow playlists that if you're trying to learn a topic, will take you from the basics right the way through to some pretty advanced stuff.